the big story in politics for the next few days is going to have to be, I think, the one-year anniversary of the Voices' defeat. What went right? What went wrong? Why did they lose? Linda, let's open up with you. What are your thoughts? You've heard what I had to say about it. still the rancor on the yes side about where it all went wrong for them. What do you think? Look, books will and have been written on this, haven't they? And, of course, 40% of the nation did vote yes, and we have a history of referendum losses in this country. That's the truth sure, of it. On absolutely. conservative and progressive sides of politics. So I'm sure that the analysis will continue and that this week, as you say, James, will bring a looking back on this year. I think, if anything, though, we want... Uh, to look forward. And Australians at the moment in particular, given everything that's going on in the world, giving you know, all the unrest uh, in the Middle East, so many different reasons, Australians want unity. They want to have government that is working hard for them, that is producing clear outcomes in the public interest. And I think that some of these fights and trying to dredge up kind of all this dispute and disagreement, to be honest, belong where they are in the past. So I just hope that the commentary this week, when people look back on the referendum, they look back at where it went, what happened, you know, where the campaigns could have improved, and there's no doubt that campaigns can always be improved, that they do so in the spirit of unity and moving forward together, not in a spirit of division. Yeah, but of course, a little bit of division, James Ashby, is not always a bad thing because, of course, division is where you get disagreements and ideas and sparks come out of all of that. But I want to ask you about what Linda's just said here because, you know, if we want to move forward together as a nation, I mean, was it a mistake, do you think, James Ashby, as a political strategist, to waste more than a year of your opening political capital as a new government on this vote, which you know, no matter what you th thought about it, was really divisive. Well, it was always going to be a distraction for a new government, but the commitment was made, and so Anthony Albanese thought this was the most important thing for Australians to deal with at the time. Uh, it wasn't, and that's the reality of it. Look, I agree with Linda, we don't want division in the country, and that's why 60% of the Australian population said no to this. There was too much division that was outlined over that 12 months. I'm glad we had time to flesh this out. I'm glad that we had the conversation. We heard both sides. Uh, there was one side that wasn't very honest whatsoever, and that's why they lost. And now we live 12 months on with a problem where Megan Davies still hasn't gotten over this. Anthony Albanese said that, look, whatever the outcome, we'll live by it. But there are people like Megan Davies who live in perpetual victimhood status and so many other people within the in Indigenous community. And white guilt is also playing a, a big play and a big part in this across the country from those on the left side of politics. And that's why we haven't been able to move on. Here in Queensland, the Liberal National Party are as much to blame for passing treaty as what Labor are. And we're now stuck in three years of truth-telling inquiries across Queensland, something that can't be unravelled, despite the LNP claiming they've walked back from that position. But the genie's out of the bottle. Well, the rainbow, the rainbow serpent's out of the bottle in this case, and we can't <laughs> put it back in. And, and the issue that we've got now is that division is continuing to flourish. We had a, a Bruce Highway blow-up here just to the south of me a couple of months ago, and they had to do a cultural heritage report before being able to patch it up and reopen it. So the problem is being perpetuated by those still within Labor, still within the left, and I don't see any improvement until we reach a point where people say, enough's enough, let's just move on as Australians, all as one. Christian, I want to bring you in on the conversation here now, too, because one of the big things we keep hearing about this campaign now from people like Megan Davis is this idea that misinformation was responsible for the voice falling over, not the fundamental problems with the proposal. Now, my colleague here, Peter Credlin, has a great column today. She has said that if her reporting had been done on the voice post a misinformation bill, i.e. if the misinformation bill had passed before, you know, that could not have been possible, and yet she turns out to have been right about an awful lot of the stuff that she wound up revealing here. What do you think, Christian, about this misinformation bill? Is this a reaction to the failure of The Voice and a way to sort of get their own back, or is this part of a broader kind of thing that we're seeing in Western democracies 
around the world where they're trying to figure out ways to limit speech in general. You want to frustrate me or get my blood to boil, James? Bring up <laughs> misinforma misinformation and stifling free speech. It is uh, abhorrent that they are calling 60% of Australians uh, stupid, pretty much, by saying that the reason why the voice didn't get up was because there was misinformation around. People voted no in the referendum for several reasons. And having healthy conversations about a referendum that could potentially change our constitution was important. And it's important to hear people that you disagree with. And the fact that they have tried to leverage off the voice into this misinformation keeps me up at night because we will end up in an Orwellian thought police kind of situation if they are able to get this over the line and, yeah, help us if they do. So, yeah, frustrating for me, James, and 60% of Australians voted no in the referendum and they should listen to that.